So now we're going to look at solutions, and in particular, ideal solutions. So just as there were ideal gases, it turns out there are ideal solutions. And we're going to uh, spend two lectures on this, so this is lecture one of ideal solutions. So let's actually you know, look uh, at a solution in some sense. So here's a beaker, and it's got a bunch of molecules in it. And to make life easy, let's just talk about binary solutions for now. Everything we develop is generalizable to more components, but binary is the easiest way to think about it. So we have two types of molecules in the binary, as I say, it could be more, randomly distributed. So who knows where they might be in the beaker, they just go where they will. Typically, in an ideal solution, the two molecules involved are going to be similar in size and shape. So here I have little spheres, little black spheres, little white spheres. It'll also generally be true that the forces between the liquids with themselves and interacting with the other component are rather similar to one another. And so good examples of that might be benzene and toluene. Right? Toluene has a methyl group on the arrow ring. So those are pretty similar molecules. Hexane and heptane, both linear alkanes, one is one unit longer than the other. So in an ideal solution, and indeed the definition of an ideal solution, the partial vapor pressure of component J is given by what's called Raoul's Law. And it says that the vapor pressure of that component above the solution, that's where the vapor is, is equal to the mole fraction of that component in the solution times the pure vapor pressure of the pure liquid. So uh, in a sense, that's, that's just a nice uh, kind of linear increase. As I go from having none, which would be a mole fraction of zero, obviously there's no vapor pressure because there are no molecules. And then as I ramp up all the way to being pure that component, when I perforce must have the vapor pressure of the pure substance, I just go up linearly with mole fraction. More molecules I put into the solution, more go into the gas phase. So that is what I put into words, mole fraction in solution, vapor pressure of the pure substance. So we can ask then, what's the total vapor pressure above an ideal solution? So I've got Raoul's law here. I've got the chemical potential of J in solution, and we got that from the last video. So it's chemical potential of the pure substance plus RT log, this vapor pressure divided by pure substance. So when I put all those together, incidentally, I can now substitute for the partial pressure of the vapor, the Raoul's law expression. So I will insert mole fraction pressure of pure liquid. When I do that, of course, I cancel the partial pressures of the two pure liquids, and I get this expression. Namely, the chemical potential in solution is that of the pure liquid plus RT log its mole fraction. That actually also serves as a thermodynamic definition of an ideal solution if it's true for all values of x sub j. So the total vapor pressure of the ideal solution, in a binary case, that's going to be mole fraction 1 times pure liquid vapor pressure of 1 plus mole fraction 2 times pure liquid vapor pressure of 2. By the definition of mole fraction, x1 is 1 minus x2, so I can get rid of one of those variables. And I can rearrange this a bit and write it as the total vapor pressure will vary with the amount of component 2 as vapor pressure of liquid 1 plus, as much 2 starts entering, difference in the vapor pressures of 2 and 1. That one's maybe easier just to see. So if I mix benzene and toluene, and down here is mole fraction benzene, so I'm starting with no benzene at all, in which case the total vapor pressure is here, and it's pure toluene. If I have 100% benzene, the vapor pressure is here, and the total vapor pressure goes from one to the other as I move along. So I start over here at the toluene, and as I begin to add in uh, benzene, it's 
contribution to the vapor pressure. So that's what this line is, the contribution of benzene to the vapor pressure. And it's linear, right? It starts at zero. That's what Raoul's law says. It's linear in mole fraction. So it starts at zero and it goes to its pure component. Toluene starts at zero and it goes to its pure component. And summing these two together, well, that's really what this line is. Start at P1 star, that's the intercept. Linear in mole fraction of two, that's why this is a line. And the slope of that line is the difference in the two pure liquid vapor pressures because this spans an interval of one. That's the beauty of mole fraction. When you do rise over run, the run with mole fraction is always one. So here's a chance again to work a bit with these equations and look at, in an ideal solution, what are the maximum and minimum values of the chemical potential of component J? And here you have a chance to pause and uh, take a look at this explanation. And now let's move on to look at mixing. That is, what's the change in free energy associated with making a solution? So the mixing free energy is easy to define. It is the total free energy of the solution you form minus the free energy of the original two pure liquids. So G of solution minus G1 star minus G2 star. Remember, the star refers to the pure substance. So in an ideal solution, we will have uh, the mixing of the chemical potentials, because it's a mixture, so we use chemical potentials, minus the chemical potentials of the pure substances. And if we exploit our expressions for the chemical potential of the solution, which is the pure substance plus RT log mole fraction, we see that when I, I plug this in up here, I'm gonna get N1 times mu1 star, and it's gonna cancel out this N1 times mu1 star. Similarly, when I use two for a subscript, I'm gonna cancel out that term. All I'll be left with is these RT log mole fraction terms multiplied by their respective number of moles. All right, so the mixing free energy is RT, number of moles log mole fraction one, plus number of moles log mole fraction two. Remember that mole fraction is a number between zero and one. It's bounded by those two, those two uh, values. So the logarithm of a number less than one and greater than zero is well-defined and it's always negative. So this says that it is always favorable to mix an ideal solution. This is a negative number, this is a negative number. Number of moles is a positive number, you can't have negative substance. And R and T are positive quantities. So it's always favorable to mix if you have something to mix. So let's uh, continue to work with that a bit, just bring that equation forward. I can now uh, inquire a bit more about the components of G that are being affected by that mixing. So if I ask, for instance, about the entropy of mixing for this ideal solution. Well, the entropy is the partial derivative of the free energy with respect to temperature, negative. And that's an easy derivative to take. So I'll put in the negative sign and partial, partial T with respect to T is one. So I'm left with this expression. The mixing volume for an ideal solution is partial derivative of the free energy with respect to pressure. And when I look at this expression, pressure does not appear. So there is no change in volume to form an ideal solution. You may recall in the last video, we saw a case where there was a change in volume. Mixing propanol and water could give rise to a reduction in volume. So that's not an ideal solution. We, we know that right away. But let's stick with ideal solutions for a little while. We'll get to non-ideal soon enough. And then finally, uh, we can talk about the enthalpy of mixing of an ideal solution. And since enthalpy is G plus TS, so then delta H is delta G plus T delta S. Well, here, here was my expression for uh, delta S. If I multiply that times temperature, I get the negative of that quantity. So evidently, the, the enthalpy of mixing is also zero. And that goes back to what I said at the beginning of the lecture, that in an ideal solution, the interactions between the molecules 
really tend to be the same as they were between individual molecules of the pure substances. So there's not really a change in the interaction energies. What's driving this is entropy. You pour two things together, there's now more space for those two things to occupy, and that's better from an entropic standpoint. And indeed, we saw a formula that looked very like this for the mixing of two gases. So ideal solution driven totally by entropy, no heat of mixing, no variation in volume. And by no variation in volume, what I mean is no variation in the total volume of the solution compared to the sum of the volumes of the two original quantities. All right, that's the beginning of ideal solutions. We'll look at them in a bit more detail in the next lecture.